Then we would. I, I am live. <laughs> I'm always live. I'm always live. We got a live group tonight. I'll tell you. Glory to God. Welcome to all of you who are online. By the dozens, it seems lately, people joining in. Uh, we're we're taking this whole. Uh, series. We eventually be wrapping it together in a package. It'll end up showing up on our YouTube channel. And uh, any, any way we can make it, our, our commitment is to get the word out as we perceive it, our part of the kingdom. It's not the whole kingdom for any means. People say, do you preach the whole counsel of God? I said, I don't know the whole counsel of God. <laughs> <laughs> and and my, my attempt is to make sure I know my part and make sure I'm not trying to do somebody else's part. But I'm doing the assignment my master gave me. He gave other people different assignments. That's their job. As long as they're carrying out their assignment, that's between them and God. Amen? Amen. Glory to God. Well, Father, we do thank you tonight. We can uh, delve once again into what your word teaches us about walking uh, in your plan for our life in the kingdom of God here and now. Uh, We thank you that you have not hidden your word from us. It may be hidden for us, but not from us. And if we show due diligence and and simply open your word and consider what it has to say to us, then by Holy Spirit you'll give us revelation knowledge, not so we can be uh, intellectually ahead of anyone else, but so that your word is effectively at work in our lives, changing us and changing those around us. In Yeshua's name, amen. All right, let's jump into it. Last week uh, we talked about Paul. Uh, If you didn't get the outline on that, we do have that available. We spent the whole hour just running through the things about who Paul is, literally running through it. Uh, It it would take hours to go and take each verse and look at it. But all you have to do is read that list of verses and you quickly understand who Paul was, what he believed, what he didn't do that much of the church thinks that he did. I was watching a uh, a video clip today that had some quotes from from a... a pastor of one of America's mega churches, uh, 40,000 people in the church, where he's speaking against the very things that I'm teaching here. And uh, interestingly, because at one point he said, and you know, Paul had a commission to detach from the, from the Jewish faith. To de- unhitch is his word, unhitch from the Jewish faith. Well, I don't know where he got the idea Paul had that commission, but I wanted to send him my list that, that we used last week. Then how do you account for what the man said, what the man did, all throughout his entire life? How do you take what you just gave us an impression, that Paul had a commission from Yahweh Almighty God, well actually it wouldn't be from Yahweh because he probably wouldn't recognize the name Yahweh, but from God to, to chart a new thing and to cut himself off of the old that doesn't line up with the reality of Paul's life. So anyway, by review, <laughs> glory to God, uh, we are meddling with traditions, uh, we are, uh, are, are tackling some traditions. In the midst of it, uh, we, we have a destination. And the destination, uh, the first destination is our, our first stop. We haven't gotten to the first stop at, yet. We've been at this for six weeks, I believe. Uh, we haven't gotten to the first stop yet, where I really want to start picking apart and understanding what the word law means in the, the framework of Pharisaic Judaism in the time of Yeshua and Paul. Because if we don't understand it, then we don't understand what on earth Paul is writing about. But on our way there, we're, uh, we're addressing uh, uh, traditions that get in the way of that. Uh, we have a couple of more I'm going to look at tonight. And uh, I keep saying at the end of each week, I think next week we're going to get to the... I mean, I've got the outline already to look at the various Jewish words for law. We haven't gotten there yet, but hopefully next week we'll get to that. But, but the question is this, is it wrong for Christians to have traditions? And I have to raise this because whenever we, uh, whenever we expose or look at or say, let's consider a, a, a t- traditional teaching of Christianity, you know, people feel threatened by their traditions. And I'm, I'm not in a world where my, my goal is to tear down traditions. My, my goal is this, is to expose traditions which are biblical and those which aren't. Uh, Yeshua in Matthew 7, 7 said to the Pharisees, you nullify the word of God for the sake of your tradition. And yet at other times he practiced tradition. So what gives? It's very simple. If the tradition lines up with the word of God, there's nothing wrong with it. But if the tradition contradicts the word of God, in other words, the word of God calls something black and you call it white. That is a contradictory 
uh, I don't care how long you've had that tradition. Is if there's a tradition in Christianity and you say, well, as far back as we read the, through the church fathers, that's been the tradition. But if the tradition contradicts the word of God, it, it doesn't matter if Origen or, you know, uh, early church fathers said that. They were Gentiles who came in with their own traditional thinking. If they brought something into Christianity and taught it, but it doesn't line up with the Word of God, it doesn't become more valid because it's older. You know, well, that, it's been around for 1,500 years. That doesn't make it right. And so we need to learn to, to evaluate our traditions by the Word of God. The Amplified Bible for uh, Matthew 7, 7 says, For the sake of your traditions, the rules handed down by your forefathers, you've set aside the word of God, depriving it of force and authority, and making it of no effect. Now notice what the Amplified does there, because this is a general theme throughout our, our whole conversations, is the rules handed down by your forefathers, contrasted with you set aside the word of God. And we're going to find even tonight where, at a first blush, you think, well, they're talking about the Torah. They're not talking about the Torah. They're talking about the rules of the fathers. And that's a code. The rules of the fathers doesn't mean they're quoting Leviticus. It means they're quoting the oral traditions that have come down. So they can be talking about Torah, or they can be talking even about the law of Moses, but the way they use it, it's clear, it's the oral interpretation. So you will read, I think tonight at one point, we'll come to a place where it says what, what Moses spoke. But we're not after what Moses spoke. That's oral tradition. We're after what did Moses write. Those are key words. Because the rabbis have this whole thing that outside of what was written, there were things that Moses spoke. Well, we don't know that. We don't have any record. It was passed by word of mouth. And some of that contradicts what was written. What do you choose? What you tell me he said or what we know was written. Okay? So, so even in the Amplified of Matthew 7, 7, they capture that by contrasting rules handed down by your forefathers and the word of God. So the criteria to to evaluate a tradition, a tradition must not break a commandment of Scripture. And a tradition of man, even if it's okay, must not be legislated into law. We have a tradition in our church, we do X, Y, Z. And, and it doesn't contradict any Scripture. That's okay, that's your tradition here in Fitchburg or wherever you are. It's when you take your tradition and say, that's the law, or worse, you say, that's what the Bible teaches. And my favorite example of that is, is lighting candles at Shabbat. If you want to light candles at Shabbat to usher in Shabbat, fine, that's a great tradition. It's a tradition uh, from the, the Jewish community, and we can pick it up. But if you follow the rabbis, they have the ritual prayer, you say, at that time. And the prayer says that we light our candles as you have commanded God never commanded lighting candles. The rabbis did. But see, if you accept as you commanded, and you don't say the scripture did, and, and then you get confused, then anything the rabbis tell you he commanded, you just swallow it. That's what God commanded. And it's not what God commanded. So we light candles every Shabbat, but we never say, as you have commanded. He didn't command it. Glory to God. Are we on the same page? So Yahweh's view of the importance of his word is simple. Deuteronomy 12.32 says, You must be careful to do everything I am commanding you. Do not add to it or subtract from it. Key verse. Key verse. Do not add to it or subtract from it. Okay? Do not add to it or subtract from it. So, in other words, if things that we read in the New Testament, the Brit Hadashah, the, the New Covenant, if they have subtracted from or added to in a way that changes the Old Testament, something's wrong. My personal conviction is nothing's wrong with the Brit Hadashah. It's my understanding that's wrong. 
okay, that I'm not understanding if I think there's a contradiction. Or what we have is then God saying here don't add to it, and over here it becomes okay to add to it, and now you're telling me throw out what God said there, and now the unchangeable God has changed. i got a real problem with that. Glory to God. So, so tonight I, I, I want to take a quick look before we go somewhere else with this about lawlessness. Lawlessness. Matthew chapter 7 verse 22 and 23 in the NIV. Many will say to me on that day. This is a disturbing passage. I, uh, you know, I'd like to preach on it but then we'd never get to the rest of these notes because I, I could at the drop of a pen preach on this one for, for an hour. Many will say. Many are going to. This is not a random thing. Come on, when we look at the move of, of what's going on in the church world today, many will say to me on that day, it's a scary passage to me, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? Now, I, I, I wish he had simply said, Lord, did we not profess you? And then he went on and say what he's going to say. But, but the, these guys here, did we not prophesy in your name, drive out demons in your name, and perform miracles in your name? So they were operating in the church, and they were operating under what appeared to be a gift of prophecy in the name of Jesus or in the name of Yeshua. They were casting out demons in the name of Yeshua, and they were performing miracles in the name of Yeshua. That says to me by all outward means by which I would be able to evaluate them, not spiritual means, but outward means, I'm going to say not only are they in the church, they're very involved in the church. These, these, you know, 99% of Christians are not casting out demons and performing miracles. And he says to them, I will tell them plainly, I never knew you away from me, you evildoers. Whoa, that's heavy, heavy, heavy. <laughs> in the King James Bible it says you that work iniquity no wait a minute they're driving out demons performing many miracles and uh, prophesying in the name of Yeshua and yet Yeshua calls them workers of iniquity what's going on there the Amplified says that I, you, uh, I will say publicly I never knew you depart from me you who act wickedly disregarding my commands so on one hand, they're preaching what the Bible says, but on another hand, they're disregarding the commands of God. And he calls that wickedness. Just as an aside, people will say, well, how are they doing these things? It wasn't the power in the man, it was the power in the name. Come on, the power in the name and the, uh, it, and, and the, the goodness of God that was operating. But the person who was operating that was in disregard to the commands as another name for laws of God. So in the NET version it says this, Yeshua says, I never knew you, go away from me, you lawbreakers. And then it has a little asterisk with a number telling you you can look up the Greek word for that. And the Greek word they say literally is workers of lawlessness. Wow. Now we're seeing something in this passage we may not have seen. What is the characterization of these people who are operating in the church and, and are doing things that would give all the appearance that they're, you know, they're tight with Yeshua, but he says to them, you are a worker of lawlessness. Lawlessness. And the contemporary Jewish Bible says this, then I will tell them to their faces, I never knew you. Get away from me, you workers of lawlessness. There it is again. You workers of lawlessness. Now the Greek word there is anomia. A-N-O-M-I-A is a transliteration. Anomia, which means lawless or without law. So all the translations probably should have used that word. You know, instead of you evildoers are wicked, the, the Greek word is literally lawlessness or without law. And it comes, uh, anomia comes from the, the Greek word nomus, which means law, and the word anti in front of it means without. So very clearly, 
Yeshua is saying that the end times, there's going to be many people, and the accusation the Lord of the church is going to hold against them is that they were against the law of God. Or they were without the law of God. I, I told Donna today, you know, we were talking about some of the things together we were reviewing, and I said, I never thought I'd I live in this kind of a day. I thought the attacks against the church would all come from the outside, growing up as a young Christian, the Antichrist, and everything coming from the outside. I never thought I'd see the day. This particular pastor that I was talking about who's, who's written a book that, that I'll talk about at some other point, not today, uh, but, um, you know, clearly, it, it, it's clear words. He said, we need to unhitch from the Ten Commandments. We are not under obligation to the Ten Commandments. If you had ever told me in my life that I'd hear a pastor who's outgoing and charismatic and energetic and has what all appearances is this huge ministry, second largest church, according to some in the United States, and, and, and he says, uh, you know, that it's time to get away from the Ten Commandments. I would have said, you're kidding me. You know, how would that ever happen? And so from this Greek word, we get the, the word antinomian. An antimony, antinomian, antinomian is one who holds that under the gospel dispensation of grace, the moral law is of no use or obligation because faith alone is necessary to salvation. So an antinomian is one who rejects a socially established morality. Now that's apart from its religious context. So out in the world, our, our, our nation right now is filled with antinomians. People who reject even a socially established morality. Each man does his own thing. But within the church, that means those who are against the law. Therefore, the, the, the scriptures are going to call them lawless. Now, again, my, my example, I, I come back at least every other teaching on this, keeping the law of the United States does not make you a citizen. Keeping the law of God does not cause you to be part of the, uh, of the family of God. Okay, you're saved by grace. So once you are a citizen, however, you take the test, you pass the test, once you're a citizen, you are not free from the obligation to keep the law. You can't say, now that I'm a citizen, I can speed at 80 miles an hour down Route 2. And when they pull me over, say, wait a minute, I wasn't a citizen yesterday, so I obeyed the law. But today I'm a citizen, so I don't have to keep the law. Would you? You know, I say to people, oh, who would ever think that? Well, you do as a Christian when you think that somehow now that you've come to Christ, or somehow you're in a new covenant, which Paul was very careful to say means you're grafted into Israel, you're grafted into something that was already going. Where'd you ever get the idea that once you're in it, you don't have to keep the law? That's exactly what's being preached, not subtly, very clearly today, in words that are, that are startling. Glory to God. Keeping the law does not save you. You're saved by grace. But once you're saved, are you free, really, to think you can run around and ignore the law of God? Yeshua says, yeah, these people were running around in the church, doing great things in the church, but at the end he says, depart from me, you were lawless. I, I think he's speaking to exactly what's going on right now. You're doing great things in the church, but you're against the law and you're teaching others to be against the law. That's a very precarious position to be in. So in James Chapter 2, verse 14, James says, What good is it, brothers, if a man claims to have faith, but he has no deeds? Can that faith save him? Oof. You know, the, 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 the answer is, no, it can't. You know, can you say, I have faith, but there's no evidence? You're not doing anything that God says to do. You're not doing the things he says to do. And James says, can that faith save him? And today people would say, yes, it's all by grace, you're saved. But James says, if there's no deeds, deeds what? I'm doing what the commandments say. If there's no deeds, that faith can't save you. And yet people are being told that it can. Glory to God. In Jeremiah 31, 31, the time is coming when I will make a new covenant 
And there's a lot of talk about the new covenant. And in fact, this, this book that this uh, pastor wrote is, is that Yeshua came specifically to do away with the old and to establish a brand new religion. And that God's finished his covenant. Wait a minute. How can you finish an everlasting covenant? And by the way, if you're done with your everlasting covenant with the Jew, and now you say, Don, would you like to be part of my new everlasting covenant in the church? Well, how can I have any confidence that if you weren't faithful to your covenant with a Jew, you're going to be faithful to me in the church? We have a schizophrenic God. The Old Testament is filled with words of his promise. I'll never break my covenant. I'll always be there. And in fact, in Jeremiah, he talks, I'm going to actually renew the covenant. And in verse 33, he said, this is a covenant I will make with the house of Israel after that time. I'll put the law in their minds and write it on their hearts. It's my law, my Torah. And yet we have people today saying the Torah is done away with. This is not a matter of, of a, a theological debate. This is not a, well, you know, you see it that way, I see it this way. In the light of Matthew, where Yeshua says, in that day many will say, we belong to you, but I'll say I never knew you. And the the reason he doesn't know them is they were anti-law, anti-Torah, should give us reason to think, well, what do I need to do with the Torah? In Matthew chapter 5, verse 19, Yeshua says, anyone who breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be great in the kingdom of heaven. The word break uh, is the Greek word luo, which means to loosen, release, or dissolve. So if I say, you don't need to keep the Ten Commandments, I have loosened and broke the Ten Commandments, and I'm teaching you, you don't need to do it. Come on. Bad enough that I'm doing it. Worse that I'm teaching others to do it. And Yeshua says, you're going to be least in the kingdom. Practicing is and teaches that Greek is poieo, which means to make, do, carry out, establish, and practice. So if I'm working to keep it and teaching you, let's together keep it, then, then, I'm, then I've got a better place in the kingdom of God than running the risk that I'm lawless. So the question is this, are there commandments one should follow to be called a disciple of Yeshua? And I think Matthew chapter 5 verse 19 says yes. Now, Tonight, I, I want to give an example of this. You still with me? Okay, I, I feel like I'm riding a wild horse here, so, uh, so uh, we'll, we'll stay together. Uh, I, 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 I've got a passion for these things, and I need hours to teach them, so I'm, I'm just trying to cut across enough surface so you get a feel for it, and then you can, you can dig deeper. Uh, I, I'm listening to clips from, from the sermons that this, this pastor has preached, and and he's giving a list suddenly, and he's written it in his book, by the way, of, um, of reasons why uh, Yeshua came and the, and the apostles came to do away with. I mean, they didn't come to reform. They didn't come to make new. They came to literally bury Judaism and reestablish a new religion. The God's covenant under the Old Testament with Israel. And God's covenant under this new covenant is with the world. This is what this guy believes. By the way, 38,000 people listen to him every week. And, and this is why we got to say, what is going on in the body of Christ that this isn't some little voice somewhere speaking? By the way, he, he, he pastors in the same church where there's another mega church down there, predominantly African American, where that pastor's saying the same things. And who came to last year when he finally said, you can't listen to the teachings of Yeshua to apply to you because he was teaching to them under the old covenant. You know, I, I just sat there amazed. I said, you are telling me I shouldn't listen to the teachings of the Lord of the church? Because he taught under the old... I mean, how did you... Well, I know how he got there. This is where this is leading. And in fact, will be what many people think Christianity is a brand new religion, has nothing to do with the Word of God. Hallelujah. So in the midst of his talking about, you know, and making categorical statements about, well, you know, Paul rejected all his Jewish upbringing and, and severed it, and uh, his relationship with Judaism, is, he just said that, gave no verses, 
He doesn't get verses for a lot. You know why? He has no verses. He has a theology, but he has no verses to back it up. Where's the Bible? Where's the Bible for this? And yet people will say he said it, and now he's written it. No Bible for it. But in the midst of that, he said, if you, if you don't understand, he said, and then it came to the Jerusalem council, and the Jerusalem council said, Gentiles don't have to keep the law at all. The law's done away with. And that's about the time I lost it. <laughs> Watching him, I said, read your Bible. Read your, see, he says that, and people hear that, and they go, out, oh, and then they're going to turn to somebody who's trying to explain about Torah, and they say, well, don't you know the Jerusalem council uh, did away with that, said we don't have to keep, it, keep the law. Really? Do you know where the Jerusalem council is in your Bible? Well, no, I didn't even know it was there. Can you tell me what chapter it is? Have you ever read, read it? Now, li listen, I'm, 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 not, I'm not condemning people. I'm asking people to wake up. And what we got to wake up is to what tradition has done for us, to us, not for us. For years, in, early in my ministry, I would talk about Paul's thorn in the flesh uh, and, and use it. Well, we don't know why somebody got sick and died, but even Paul had his thorn in the flesh. Why did I say that? Did I ever study it out and see what the Bible said? I mean, I knew there was a phrase, you know, because of the exceeding revelations given to me, there was given to me a, a thorn in the flesh to buffet me unless I get it proud and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, I kind of knew it was in there. But what was I taught through a sermon somewhere, through a professor teaching, was Paul's thorn in the flesh because, because he had these great revelations from God. God said, I don't want you to get a puffed head. So the same God that gave him the revelations sent him a disease to handicap him. I mean, that's what I was taught. And so you know what I did? I taught. The same thing. I passed on the tradition. I did not think I was passing on a tradition. I thought I was passing on what the Bible said. Until one day I ran smack dab into somebody saying, that's not what it says. And I said, really? I stopped the little cassette I was listening to and I opened my Bible and, and then I turned on the cassette to listen how this man taught and it's like it is as clear as day, at least it was to me. It's very clear. It's very clear. It wasn't a sickness or a disease at all. It was a pain in the rear end. You say, you know, that guy's a, a pain in the rear end. Does not mean that you literally have a physically, you know, hurting rear end or something. You know, it, 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 it's very clear. The Greek is very clear. The term thorn in the flesh is very clear when you start searching it out. It was a demonic influence sent to buffet Paul. That word buffet means to shake and try to get the message out of him. And how did he shake him? Threw him in jail, criticized him, stoned him and left him for dead, raised up all manner of people. People were against him. His whole life was this, this demonic influence. It was not that Paul's running around sick. And by the way, God didn't say, no, keep it. What he said is, Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. He didn't say insufficient. Paul said, I asked him three, three times, God, take this off of me. And God said, my grace is sufficient. That doesn't mean bear up with it. That doesn't mean keep it. It says, I gave you my, my grace. And my grace in you, Paul, is able to overcome that. And the rest of Paul's life is an example of every time that spirit came to Buffett, Paul overcame him. He blew a ship out from under him on his way to Rome, bit him with a snake. And Paul shook off the snake, swam to the shore during the storm. Paul was triumphant all the time. Why? Because Not because God did something. God gave gave him the grace so he could use it to overcome. And yet I was taught in most Christians believe, well, God said, no, you're just going to have to bear up with it. And that garbage theology, and that's what it is, keeps people bound for believing what God said they could have, do, and walk in. Am I getting passionate? Yeah. Acts chapter 15, verse 1, is where we read to the Jerusalem Council. Verse 1, some men came down from Judea to Antioch, and we're teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. Now, here they are. They're, they're, we know they're from Jerusalem. We know they're, they're obviously Jewish men who came to believe in Yeshua as Messiah. More than likely, they're of the Pharisaic tradition. Uh, scriptural, literalist, however you want to do it. And they're coming into this... Uh, predominantly Gentile uh, community of believers in Antioch, and here's what they're saying. 
Unless you're circumcised according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. So you can't be saved by saying, Yeshua, I make you the Lord of my life. You can't be saved by faith. There's got to be a work attached to it. You need to be circumcised. If you don't understand what you're, what you're reading here, you look over all to get. People say, well, unless you're circumcised, you can't be saved. That's not what they're saying. Unless you're circumcised according to the custom. Your Bible or translation should say something like that. According to the custom or according to the tradition, one said. Remember what I said, are traditions good or bad? It depends upon how they line up. If you were circumcised, even as a Jew, but you did not get circumcised according to the tradition of the rabbis, you were not circumcised. And you can say, excuse me, let's step aside here, man to man. You can look and say, I was circumcised. Ah, but you weren't circumcised according to the, the, the phrase custom of Moses is talking about oral law. It's not talking about the Torah. It didn't say according to what Moses wrote, but according to the custom of Moses. You know, this exists in Christianity. There, there are uh, churches that you could go to, even in the United States now, where you want to come and join the church and fellowship with them, and they're going to ask you how you were baptized. And if you were baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, or were you baptized in the name of Jesus? And if they believe you need to be baptized in the name of Jesus, and you say, well, I was baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I gave my life to Christ. I got baptized in the name of the... Well, you were not properly baptized. Therefore, you're not really saved. To get in our church of our saved, you've got to be baptized according to our tradition that says it must be in the name of Jesus, and if you say anything else, it was not a proper baptism. Now we don't, us here in our congregation, we don't live in that kind of a, of a narrow world, but that world exists out there. <laughs> Pastor Shad's been there. He, he comes from that area of the country where you got a, you know, churches pointing fingers because it wasn't done with the right formula. So the question that they came to the Christians in Antioch was not, have you been circumcised? But have you been circumcised according to the custom taught by Moses? There is tremendous debate and very vicious debate that goes on in Israel about who is a Jew and what is a proper conversion. So that if you go down to the Reformed rabbi down in Boston, and you want to be a Jew, and you go through the classes, and you get baptized, and, and you converted to a Jew, and now you're a Jew, and now you want to immigrate to Israel, because now you're a Jew, Israel is going to say, you're not properly converted. Well, wait a minute, I'm going to synagogue every week, and I did blah, 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 but you, were, you, you went through a ritual performed by a reformed rabbi, and Israel will not recognize it. Hmm? That stuff still goes on today. Come on. And so we miss the whole beginning thing, let alone getting into the solution. We're not even into the council yet. And see, we don't even understand the presenting case. Underneath the outward, you need to be baptized, uh, circumcised, you can't be saved. No, it was, you've got to be circumcised according to oral law. We've already missed the discussion. Glory to God. All right, let's keep going. Uh, verse 2, uh, this brought Paul and Barnabas into sharp agreement and debate with them. So Paul and Barnabas were appointed, along with some other believers, to go up to Jerusalem to see the apostles and elders about this question. The church sent them on their way, and as they traveled through Phoenicia and Samaria, they told how the Gentiles had been converted. This news made all the brothers very glad. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and elders, to whom they reported everything God had done through them. Then, some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees. Why did Luke identify what party they belonged to? Because the Pharisees were the keeper of the oral tradition. When you talk to a rabbi and he says, I believe the Torah, 
and you say, I believe the Torah, you think you're talking the same thing. You're not. You're talking about, I believe in the, in the Tanakh, the scriptures. He's talking about, I believe what you believe, plus I believe in oral law, which is, they call it Torah. So he told you he believes in Torah, you believe in Torah, and you say, well, we're on the same page, you're not on the same page at all. Come on. I had some Mormon missionaries years ago uh, come to witness to me, and I said, look, look, I'd like to hear what you have to say and how you say it. And you say, well, you know, we're Christians and we believe the Bible. I said, well, good, that's great, we have a starting point. You believe the Bible and I believe the Bible. My understanding is you also believe the Book of Mormon. And they said, yes. I said, so here's the condition of discussion. Everything we talk about will be about the book we have in common. What we have in common is the Bible. What we don't have in common is the Book of Mormon. So the Book of Mormon is off the plate. And they agreed. And so we started having doctrinal discussions. And every once in a while, I would say, well, what do you believe about this? And I said, where do you find that in the Bible? And the young man was saying, well, actually, and he turned to the book. Oh, no, no, shut that book up. We agreed. We don't have anything to talk about what's in that book because we don't agree on that book. What we agree is you told me you believe the Bible. I want to know where in the Bible do you find what you just told me. And over the process of six or seven weeks, it became apparent that, that you know, the bulk of what they were teaching and believing didn't come from the Bible. Okay? We go over to Israel, we love to go to the yeshivas and see the little boys uh, learning. And by the way, I'd rather see a little boy in yeshiva than see him off in some secular-minded school. But we see all the little boys, you know, there, and they got their books or scrolls open. And we think, look at all these little boys studying Torah. The bulk of their time, they're studying the Talmud, which is commentaries on the Torah. Not the Torah itself. I mean, that was just an eyesight to me. All these little boys, at least they're reading the Torah. No, they're not. They're reading the Talmud. Glory to God. Hallelujah. So we got to make sure uh, we're on the same page. So believers who belong to the party of the Pharisees gives us a clue. We're now in an area where the issue is oral law. They stood up and they said, the Gentiles must be circumcised and required to obey the law of Moses. Now you know where I, where I have a question. What do you mean when you say they must obey the law of Moses? If you mean they should obey the first five books of the Bible, we're in agreement. If you mean they should obey the first five books of the Bible and all the other sayings and teachings that the rabbis have passed down to us, because that likewise is the law of Moses, then I'm misled if I think we're talking about the same thing. We're in a world where you can think you know what you're reading when in fact you're not. So verse 6, the apostles and elders met to consider the question. After much discussion, I think Holy Spirit is, is kind of being coy with us there. I, you know, knowing how Jews can discuss and everything together, this was days, maybe even you know, all night long discussions. After much discussion, Peter got up and addressed them. And he goes and talks about how the, the, God reached out to the Gentiles, okay? Uh, in verse 9, he says that God made no distinction between us and the Gentiles, for he purified their hearts by faith. Now then, verse 10, why do you try to test God by putting on the necks of the disciples a yoke that neither we nor our fathers have been able to bear? What was the yoke they could not bear? It was not the yoke of Torah. Are you saying that Yahweh gave a law that, that, that crushes us that we can't bear? It was the yoke of oral tradition. And Yeshua, we can do a study on this sometime, Yeshua in the Gospels all over the place is coming smack against the Pharisees for laying laws on the people that the Bible didn't say. Now, do they still do that? Oh, you better believe it. Absolutely. So the Bible says, you shall not boil a kid in its mother's milk. So I have a calf and I'm going to, we're going to have a sacrificial dinner and I'm going to kill the fatted calf and we're going to have a great roast beef dinner. Okay? And there's, there's the cow out there. And what the Bible says, I can't go milk that cow 
and then boil the meat of the kid in that milk. What is that about? I, I'm not going to get into de it's It's about a compassion for your animals. And if you can't have compassion for your animals, you can't have compassion for human beings. The rabbis interpret it this way. You cannot mix milk, uh, dairy, and meat. And that leads to the point where you can go in Orthodox homes right here in Massachusetts, and they have a complete set of dishes for yeah. meat, and a separate set of dishes for dairy, and in the houses that can afford it, they, they have dishwashers for meat and dishwashers for that. This was a, a kosher kitchen in here at one time, and, and you know, you didn't mix things together, you had to keep it that way. None of that is scripture. And that's a burden, and that's why over 70% of Israelis reject their Jewish religion. Who can keep it? Over 70% of, of Israelis are not Orthodox Jews. Orthodox Jews are about a, a quarter. Now, by the way, if they got their, their commitment to the word right, I'd, I'd rather an Orthodox Jew listening to the scripture than a secular Jew just going out and do, doesn't even open the Bible. But what, what have they rejected? They've rejected the, the rabbinic teaching which is put on them as this is what God said, but God didn't say. Okay, So this is what's going on here. When, when Peter says, why would we put a burden on them that we, we, we can't keep? Come on. He's not talking about why should we put Torah on them and we can't keep it. Why should we put the burden of all these laws? Come on, laws. They're not God's laws. They're man-made laws. Hmm. Okay. What, this will be proved out in just a minute. So in verse 11 he says, we believe it's through grace of our Lord Yeshua that we're, we're saved just as they are. So if we ended at verse 11, we'd say, yep, yeah, that's it. You know, Peter said, look, we're not going to put it, this law on them. And we believe they're saved by grace just as like we are. Uh, happy ending of the story. Paul, go back to Antioch and tell them they don't keep, need to keep the law. That's not the end of the story. You get down to verse 19 and they come to their judgment. They've had all their discussions, and further on around verse 26 or so, they're actually going to write this in a letter to them. In verse 19, it is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Instead, we should write to them, telling them, now he's going to tell them four things they need to do. He didn't say, let's write a letter to them and tell them, forget the Jewish law. You don't need to do any of it. You know, keep your pagan Gentile ways, whatever. We're just glad to have you in the family. As long as you bring your tithes to us, we're happy. Come on. So, so when a pastor like this says, the Jerusalem council said, you, you don't need to keep the law. Where does he ever see that? What we do find is they were told specifically something they should do, and I've never heard an antimonian, antinomian pastor acknowledge this is even there. I said to one pastor one time, fine, you know, that's great. So we don't have to keep the law. What do you do with the four things we're supposed to do? One pastor said to me one time, he looked at me puzzled, like, what four things? Well, you know, you don't have to, but he did say there's certain things you have to do. Okay? We should write to them telling them Number one, to abstain from food polluted by idols. You're a Gentile, you live in an idolatrous world, you eat all this, this, this food that's been sacrificed to idols. So the first requirement to come into fellowship in the synagogue with us, in the church with us, is you've got to abstain from food polluted by idols. Now I'm not going to teach what all these mean because... That's a message in itself. I'll probably do that on some Sabbath. Uh, to abstain from food. So what do you do with that? Come on. We don't need to keep the law and everything. But what do you, how are you teaching people? Look, you know, you're, you're saved by grace. But by the way, you do need to start keeping away from food polluted by idols. You don't do anything with it because in your mind you were taught, throw it all out. We don't need to keep the law. But that's not what the Jerusalem Council said. They said you need to do this. Secondly, 
You need to abstain from sexual immorality. I, I don't know anywhere that there's any uh, disagreement in the Bible about what sexual immorality is. So when do we say to Gentiles who want to get born again, yes, it's by grace you're saved, but you must abstain from sexual immorality. When I was a young Christian, gave my life to the Lord, no one ever mentioned anything. I'm a teenage boy. Wouldn't you think that'd be appropriate to have taught me that? You know, okay, Don, great, you know you're saved, you're not going to go to hell when you die, and blah, blah, all the good things, and, and here's what. But you need to know, if you're going to be a follower of Jesus, then you need to abstain from sexual immorality. And if I were dumb enough to say, what does that mean? They would have been explicit and told me what it means. Th this is a requirement. It's a requirement of the club. <laughs> okay, you, you want to get in the club? You got to abstain from sexual immorality. In a, in a lawless church, in fact, the church is teaching that it's okay to do things the Bible calls sexual immorality. Do you, do you see what's going on in the church? It, it, the, the teaching of grace supersedes law is opening the door wide where we don't even address issues of sexual perversion. Number three. From meat of strangled animals. That's right out of the book of Leviticus. How can you tell me, Pastor, that the Jerusalem Council said, you don't need to do the law of God, it's all gone away, when the Jerusalem Council, one of the things they said, in order to come into fellowship with us, you cannot eat meat from a strangled animal. Now, most pastors wouldn't know to deal with it because we don't know what that means. Well, don't you think we ought to find out what it means? Wow, well, you say, I'm not saying anything. I'm saying let's find out what it means. But don't tell me there's no requirements. The requirements are right there staring you in the face. We're going to tell them you need to do these things. And I've never heard a sermon on it. Glory to God. And finally, from blood. From blood. Now, I think, practically speaking, again, I don't want to get in and preach on it. We're going to conclude somewhere else tonight. But, but I will preach on it at a point. We need to understand what that means. Why was God concerned about boi boiling a, a kid in its mother's milk? Why was he concerned that you don't strangle an animal, but you drain the blood out of it? Why was he concerned? Why, what were all these laws about blood anyway? And I'm fully convinced that if we had kept and understood in depth all the blood laws of God about a woman in her period, about, you know, if, you're, if you, ha you can't go in because you're unclean, well, what is that? That's terrible judgment. That is because you're looking at it through Western eye. What was God trying to communicate about life? The life is in the blood. And if we really understood that, we would have never had the abortion issue we have. When we ended up throwing out that because we wouldn't look at our Jewish roots, we laid the seed to kill tens of thousands of people in the womb, which is an abomination to God. Why? Because we devalued life. All of this is about the value of life. And all about it was saying, you're living in a Gentile culture that doesn't value life. If you're going to come in here, you've got to turn to the Bible that has laws that will lead you to value life. But we threw the laws out and now we have a church that doesn't value life. Are, are you see, seeing this? All right, let's, let's, uh, let's move on. Uh, the contemporary Jewish Bible says that you, you need to abstain from things polluted by idols, from fornication, and from what is strangled in front, from blood. Verse 21. For from the earliest times, Moshe has had in every city those who proclaim in, and his words being read in the synagogue every Shabbat. In the NIV, Moses has been preached in every city from the time, early times, and is read in the synagogue on every Shabbat. Glory to God. So the question is, we look at all the commandments of God, all the mitzvot of God, the, the positive and negative, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, and thou shalt, thou shalt. We take a look at all of that. You know, and, and this council is going to say, there's four things you must do. And you want to say, four? We got 618. Why these four? And again, I'm teaching for another time. But you can think about it. 
These four had to do with fellowship. I cannot fellowship with you if you're doing these four. All the other laws, if they're bro broken, I can still fellowship with you. But these are conditions for me to even sit down at, at the table and break bread with you. These, are, these were, you're coming into the Jewish community, and we're going to tell you, if you violate these four things, you know, you can't come into the community. These are the community guidelines. These are the basics. Someone once said, well, these are like the Noahide laws, but they're different somewhat than the, the Noahide laws. But it's, it's the same kind of thinking. These are basics. Well, wh wh why didn't you tell them about the others? I guess all the rest we can throw out. No, no, no. Verse 21, for or because. You need to, you need to do these four things. That'll get you in. Why aren't we teaching you the rest? Because Moses has been preached in every city from the earliest times and is read in the synagogues every Sabbath. Oh, that is a powerful statement. That is a powerful statement. The reason I only need to get you to do these four things is, number one, you're going to be going to the synagogue every Shabbat. You're not going to a church on Sunday when this was written. There was no church. You're going to be going to the synagogue every Sabbath, which means you were a Sabbath keeper. You were expected to be a Sabbath keeper. He didn't say, uh, because Moses is, is, is read in the synagogue yeah, several days a week, pick the day you want to go. No, every Shabbat. So the expectation, the only thing that makes biblical sense, literary sense, is the expectation is you Gentile are going to give your life to Yeshua. You don't need to be circumcised according to the rabbis, but you do need to keep these things. Now get yourself down to the synagogue. Every Shabbat we expect you to show up. We know you're going to be there. People today raise their hand, give their life to the Lord, and no one even tells them they've got to start going to church. Come on. Are there rules? Are there laws? Or is, is it just all grace? Don't tell me the Jerusalem Council said you can do whatever you want. Now, if you want to say you can do whatever you want, have at it. But don't tell me that's what the Jerusalem Council said. The expectation of the Council is you're going to be in synagogue every Shabbat, and what's going to happen? Moses is read. Do you see that in your translation? Moses is read. Now, that's important. The minute they, that, that the council said Moses is read, they're talking about the written word of God. They're not talking about, and there you're going to learn what the rabbis say. Let me, let me you Bible scholars, let me hearken you back to a, a time when Yeshua said a very confusing thing about uh, the rabbis. You know, do what they say, but don't do what they do. Well, if you read it and understand it, what he's saying is when they're in there, what they say is, is referring to what they're reading from the Torah. So do what the rabbi says when he stands up, up, up at the pulpit and says, the Torah reading for today is bear a sheet such and such, and on rolls the scroll. That's his saying. Do that, but don't do what he does. It was a fight over is it the written Torah, or does it include the oral Torah? And if we don't understand that, we don't have a clue what Paul was trying to address in the church. And the Jerusalem Council basically rejected oral Torah. You don't have to be circumcised, like the rabbi said. But they never rejected the Torah of God. Mm. Let me give you a, a, a quick example that, to me it, it spoke, but you know, back when the Vietnam War was going on, uh, Young men were drafted into the army here in the United States, and they were sent to Fort Dix for, for training. And uh, I can remember being down at the training camp. That a miserable place down there. <laughs> I went there as a second lieutenant, so that was a little better experience. But, uh, but anyway, so, so you're going to go down there for whatever basic was, six weeks, eight weeks, whatever period of time. It's basic training. You know what you get in basic training? Basic training. Got to teach you how to use your rifle, got to teach you how to, uh, you know, how to dress properly, how to run, make sure you can climb over obstacles, blah, 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 get you in physical condition. But basic training did not equip you to survive in Vietnam. 
basic training put a uniform on you, trained you how to use a rifle, trained you the rudiments of being a soldier. And uh, Andrew Womack shares an interesting story about this. He talks about how you got casual in basic training. You know, you're crawling through this thing and, and bombs are going off in pits, but guess what? You know they're setting them off in pits. And you know they're not real bombs, they're charges, they're explosives. But there's sandbags all around them, they're not going to hurt you. And then they say, you better keep down because those bullets are coming over, we're shooting machine guns while you're crawling across this field. And they'll tell you, you know, and those, those bullets are coming at 18 inches, so you better stay low. And so most people, man, they're hugging the ground and bullets are flying over the head. They do this at night and they're tracer bullets. So, man, you got the stream of bullets. And Andrew, when he said this, I had to laugh. Same thing happened to me when I was at chaplain school. You know, during the daytime, we're going through the, the, uh, the preparation for that. And I'm standing up at the end of the course. You're going to crawl to the end. I'm at the end. And the sergeant's lecturing to us. And I said to one of the lieutenants there who had come over from Vietnam, he was, had been in the Army for years, but... He was going through now as a chaplain. I said, am I right? I look at those machine gun barrels, and they had an iron bar right across uh, on a platform, and the machine gun barrel came down to the iron bar, which tells me very clearly that machine gun cannot fire lower than that bar. I mean, there's a reason. The Army doesn't want to kill its own people while it's training them. Okay. So I walked to the bar, and the bar was about two feet above my head. The, 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 the acres that we're going to crawl across, lined with all these pits the, that are going to be exploding, went down. So the, the shortest spot was where I was standing, and that machine gun was two, two feet over my head. So you're lying to me. It ain't no 18 inches. And, and uh, Andrew Womack said that same thing. He says, we quickly realize they're not, they're not going to. So you kind of kind of crawled your way through. Uh, uh, Lanny and I did something a little different. We... Uh, we stood up. <laughs> it's pitch black. Nobody knows who we are. You know, things going off and all that, and searchlights going across the field. And I said, I don't want to crawl that hole. Let's walk from here to the next bunker. He says, let's go for it. So we stood up and we started walking, you know, and over the loudspeakers, and the machine gun stopping over the loudspeakers. Well, those two chaplains who are walking, get down and crawl like you're supposed to. You know, boom, oh, man, we're down there. And, and after, we didn't do it again because now that they know we did that, they're going to be looking for us, you know. So, but, but you know, because see, we knew the truth. And so Andrew shares about you know you go that's basic training. You got in the club. Four things you need to do to get in the club: stay from sexual immorality, don't don't uh, eat blood, uh, you know, don't have eat things that are uh, you know dedicated to idols, you know. So. That, that gets you in the club. Going through basic gets you in the club. They fly them to Vietnam, and that was a war pretty much unlike any other wars up to then. It's, it's wars now, but, but World War II, you took a boat, you landed in, in, in Paris. The fighting's, you know, two days inland. You've got to walk for two days to get to the battle. In Vietnam, you drop out of the sky in a plane, you're in the war. And Andrew sh shares the fact that that plane landed at Da Nang, and uh, they get out of the plane, and a mortar attack happens at the base. First minute, you're in Vietnam, they're off the plane, and it's like, everybody get down and crawl to the pits where you're, you know, the bunkers. So this is our introduction into Vietnam. You know, plane hits, man, we're down, and he says, well, we are hugging the ground, <laughs> and, and we're crawling across there. And he said, and then the next day, they started what was called the in-country training. And he says it was interesting. He looked around. It happened to him. It happened to everybody he saw. When we were back in Dix having that introduction training, you half paid attention. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, bang, boom, boom. You got used to the booms. You know, it's like, okay, I'm not bothered by machine guns and all that stuff. You got to Vietnam. He says, I paid attention to every single word that sergeant said because it became very clear this is life or death. They're, 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 this, is, this is for real. Someone out there wants to kill me. Come on. Are there rules for getting into the church? Of course there are rules to get into the kingdom of God. But that's when it begins. Because once you're in the kingdom of God, you have an enemy who tenaciously wants to see you out of commission. He wants to kill you. The devil comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. That's all he's interested. If he could have kept you from being born again, he would have done it. But he couldn't do that. So now that you are born again, his job is to defeat you. 
And the answer to not being defeated is to learn to walk in the laws God gave us to survive. The laws of God are not because he's checking a list to see if you can get in. You're in, they're for you to be able to survive and live as a child of the Most High God. They're the rules for living successfully in the kingdom. Is this beginning to make some sense to you? Glory to God. All right, let's wrap this up. So how do we defeat the devil then? It, where I want, want you to see in tonight's lesson is this. It has got to be that you know that you know that you know that you know what's written in the Bible. It cannot be your tradition. It can, you cannot be repeating things that were always repeated, but you don't know where or even if the Bible says that. I've had people say to me things like, well, you know what the Bible says, hit your wagon to a star. I said, well, you know, I've read the Bible many times. I, I don't recall a phrase, you know, hit your wagon to a star. There, there, there's, there's just a lot of garbage thinking out there that people think is very religious, sounds so good. Okay, but it's not biblical. Yeshua defeated the devil by saying, it is written. The devil came back, he said, it is written. And if you throw something at the devil, it is written, and it's not written, he knows he has you. He knows you're in tradition, and you're going to do just whatever your tradition taught you was. Secondly, Yeshua pointed to himself and, and his mission and said, it is written. Uh, Yeshua confronted the error of religious teaching by saying, it is written. The debate about the Jewish council to me is, open your Bible. Let's have, I'm not mad at you, but let's have a Bible discussion. What did the Jerusalem council say? Don't tell me it said this. I'm going to open my Bible. You open your Bible. I'm going to read and say, this is what I think it means. Now you tell me where you find that it did away with it. Man once said, I don't believe you need to get born again. Fine, let's open the Bible. You say you believe the Bible. Unless a man is, is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. He said, well, I don't think it means that. Well, what does it mean? Well, it doesn't mean what you say. Well, that's okay. You don't have to believe what I believe. But tell me, what does it mean? And, and, and he, he couldn't tell what it means because there is no other meaning. You must be born again. What are you going to do with it? But he just dismissed it altogether. Therefore, we're not having a biblical conversation. Glory to God. Paul said, it is written. Peter, Acts 1-2, said, it is written, and he quoted the Psalms. Stephen, before the Sanhedrin, says, I agree with what is written by the prophets, Acts 7-42. Acts 24-14, Paul says, I admit that I worship the God of our fathers as a follower of the way which they call a sect, I believe everything that agrees with the law and that is written. That is written. you got to clearly understand the debate is about, uh, uh, over law is about do we follow what is written or in addition do we follow the oral law of the rabbis. And if you don't, when Paul confronts law, you think he's confronting Torah. He's not confronting Torah. He's confronting the law. When we come to understand what the kingdom of God is all about, it's important that we only look at what is written. Hey Amen. Did you get anything out of this tonight? Thank you for joining us on uh, Facebook. Uh, we'll be here back next week and pick up with a little more Jewish teaching uh, as to what's behind the law.